Okay, we are in a series called On Purpose, looking at the story of the prophet Jonah and the ways that God was able to get Jonah's attention um, and did, allowed certain things to happen to Jonah on purpose uh, to get Jonah living his life on purpose for the mission God had called him to serve. Um, basic premise of this series, I've mentioned this every week, is very simply this, that every Christian has a calling. Maybe not to be a pastor or a missionary or some Bible teacher in a big vocational capacity, but every Christian has a calling of God. And that, at the very least, it, that calling is to walk in a manner worthy of our Lord, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel uh, that Christ has given us and blessed us with if you are a child of God. Uh, we are called to walk in a manner worthy. The Lord spoke to Jonah at the beginning of this letter and tells him to arise and to go. He called him physically to go somewhere. But in many ways, God calls us to go and to do certain things every single day. But we've seen as well that every time God calls us, whatever that is, in a big way or a small way, every time God calls us to something, there's always also going to be an opportunity for you and me to walk in the opposite direction. The exact moment God calls Jonah to Nineveh, there was also a ship that very moment leaving for Tarshish. He had the opportunity to go in the opposite direction, which turns out is the opportunity that Jonah took. And as a result, he finds himself on this boat in the middle of a huge storm. The boat's about to be torn apart. He ends up being thrown overboard. This great storm as a result of his disobedience. And what we learned through that that is also so important to remember, and that's why I'm reminding us all of this today, is that when those storms come in our life, when they are, whether it's a legit, literal storm or more probably a figurative one, and we've all been through those, right? Life throwing us something that just upheaves everything and throws our life in turmoil. Remember that God will use the storms in our life, and he always does, for two reasons, to get our attention and to change our direction. Sometimes God does not take us around difficult things. He takes us right through difficult things because he knows it's the best way for him to get our attention, that our attention will be turned back to him. And maybe he even wants to change our direction. In Jonah's case, he literally wanted to change his direction and have him going back the opposite way that God was sending him. And again, eventually Jonah's thrown overboard. He's swallowed by the great fish. We talked about that last week. One of the most improbable stories to accept in all of the Bible, I think, in many, many ways, that a guy would actually be swallowed by a fish, survive for three days in the belly of that fish, right? It, and I acknowledged that last week. Um, but just because it's a difficult story to believe doesn't mean it didn't happen. And last Sunday, I actually gave you three reasons why I believe it happened um, and why I, I can accept that. Go back and listen to that. Don't have time to go into all that today. But what we also learned um, is that God will create space in our lives when we need it to get our attention and to change our direction because God knows to accomplish the things that he's called me to do, I've got to become the person he's called me to be. That was the other thing we saw last week. That to do what God's called me to do, I've got to first become who God's called me to be. And in the belly of that great fish, God created the space Jonah needed to become the man that God had called him to be in order for him to do what God called him to do. And so I ended last week with this very simple question, but important question. Do you make it a regular priority to create the space necessary to become the person God's called you to be? Way more than what you do, are you being who God's called you to be? That's where we ended up last week. Today, we're gonna pick up with Jonah's story in chapter three. And what we're gonna see, I'll just tell you this up front, what we're gonna see in chapter three with Jonah today is a man who gets a second chance, which leads to a city that gets a second chance, and in all of it, we're going to see that anyone called by God can make a difference, all right? So let's go ahead and start here. After three days in the belly of the fish, that's where we left off last week. Here's where we're going to pick up today, Jonah chapter 2, the last verse in Jonah chapter 2. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. You're welcome for that. I just thought that was a great verse to start with because it paints a beautiful word picture in your mind to start this sermon. Jonah on the shore in a great big pile of fish puke. You're welcome. Moral of the story, don't run from God. <laughs> or it's liable to get worse than that, right? 
But this is where we pick up Jonah. Again, I know this is a crazy story. It's a hard to believe story. It's a story that defies the laws of nature and it does. And if it wasn't for the fact that Jesus quoted this story and I don't believe it's hard for God that created the world to pull off a simple miracle like keeping Jonah alive for three days in the bottom of the fish, right? I, I think that's possible because God can do a whole lot more than me or you. But this is where Jonah is. And so after this, Jonah on the shore, let's look at what happens next because this is really what I wanna focus on today. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, the second time. I don't know who needs to hear this today. I think we all need to remember this though. And that is that we belong to a God of second chances. Who's glad about that? Is that the only amen we got? Who's glad that we belong to a God of second chances? Listen, I spent Thursday night with a church that's a little more charismatic with a bunch of Latinos that were having a really good time. I'm gonna need you to give me some feet. They were louder than you have ever been. And I only talked for 10 minutes. So anyway, we belong to the God of second chances. And I am so incredibly happy about that. I need to be reminded of that. I need to live in that. I do live in that every single day. The Gospel of John tells us this, that Jesus Christ came to this earth as the fullness of God. And out of the fullness of God, you know what he gave us? Here's what it says, John chapter one, verse 16. Out of the fullness of God, he's given us, listen, Grace upon grace. Grace upon grace. That means in your life, God did not just give you his grace the moment you first believed in him. It means the moment you first believe started that process of God extending you grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon his marvelous grace. He's a God of second chances. Every single time you need a second chance. He's still a God of second chances. The entire premise of the message of Jesus' gospel is that there would never be a moment in your life before or after you accept Christ that you still would not need another second chance and God would be willing to give it. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time. He's a God of second chances. And when it comes to Jonah a second time, here's what God's word says to Jonah in verse two. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell you. All right, so let's stop here for just a second. This great city, how great of a city is this? I mean, when you think about the city of Nineveh and what it was, I haven't talked about it yet. I told you last week, I haven't really described Nineveh at all yet. We've only been talking really about Jonah going the opposite way than what God was calling him. Nineveh was more than just an ancient city. Check out what it's, how it describes it in the next verse. Here's how big uh, Nineveh was. So jo Jonah arose and he went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, three days journey from one end of it to the other. All right. Now there's, you, you think about that for just a minute. A city that it takes three full days to walk from one end of it to the other. There's a lot of people that live here. But I don't, it's not going to take, you ever walk downtown Claremont? It don't take three days to walk from one end to the other, right? I mean, it might, it's going to take a while to walk from one end of this zip code to the other, granted. But there's a lot of people that believe that very likely that the radius of the city of Nineveh was 60 miles, a 60 mile radius. That's a big city by today's standards, let alone ancient standards. Not getting across that very quickly. It was a tremendous city. Now, Nineveh is actually first mentioned in the Bible in Genesis chapter 10, right? So the opening book of the Bible, Nineveh, is mentioned. Uh, when a descendant of Noah, a guy named Nimrod, uh, which is a, such a great name, I'm just dying for one of these days on a Monday morning for someone in our children's ministry to come up to me. He's like, you ain't gonna believe the name of somebody that just checked their kid in yesterday. Nimrod. Like, I would love, that'd be awesome. Anyway, um, Nimrod, who's described a descendant of Noah, he's a mighty man. He leaves Assyria and he builds the city of Nineveh. And it's not really described or mentioned again until the days of Jonah, where it's called this great city that it takes three days to get from one end of it to the other. All right. It was the capital of the great Assyrian Empire. So if you think back to your history, right, the Assyrian Empire was one of the great military powers of uh, the ancient world. This was its capital city. It was located on this major highway that connected east and west. It was this major highway between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, which meant a lot of people flowed through the city. But not only did a lot of people come through it, a lot of money came through it, a lot of resources came through it. It was very well known, very strategic, a very powerful city. It was also 
a very ungodly city. It was a very pagan city. And I don't just say that to say it. It literally was a very pagan city, meaning it was a very polytheistic society. Polytheistic meaning many gods, right? It, they, they believed in many gods. Many cultures of this day believed in many gods. And what's interesting is that any culture throughout history that has been a polytheistic culture, believed in many gods, every one of those cultures was also a very violent culture. And the reason they were a violent culture was because their belief system in many gods itself lent to violence. The gods were always at war with one another. If you just think back to Greek literature, the gods were always fighting trying to show in their dominance over another god. And so if it was stormy, it was the gods fighting. If there was an earthquake, the gods were angry and fighting. And because the gods were always fighting with one another, a polytheistic culture would also view violence not only as okay, but as a good thing. We're called to conquer other people to show our gods that we are better than everybody else. And so Nineveh was a very violent place, a very pagan place, a very evil place. So much so that God sends Jonah to preach against it, right? And here is what Jonah preaches. I want you to look at, what, at his sermon, right? Here we go. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's journey, right? So he goes one third of the way into Nineveh. That's it. And he stops. And he calls out. He preaches a sermon. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's his sermon. Wouldn't you love it if I only preached that quickly? Beat everybody else to brunch or breakfast or lunch, right? Let me ask you this. Have you ever experienced a sermon that as you were sitting listening to it, God just did something in it that you weren't expecting and you've never forgot it and you've also maybe never completely been the same as a result of it? That ever happened to you? And I don't necessarily mean here, I mean anywhere. Like somebody was communicating something out of the word of God and it just gripped you. You can still remember maybe where you were sitting. It just, it, it's, it affected you that, that much. I, I can remember when I was in college. Um, I, when I was younger, I was about 15. When, when I first began to really sense God calling me, and I'll use that phrase, um, into ministry, like vocationally into ministry. And then the next few years, I kind of, you know, ignored that. And I got early years in college. And I had this brilliant idea in college that I wasn't going to go into ministry. I was going to go into business for myself. I was going to start a bunch of companies and grow them really big and make a lot of money so I could give a lot of money to God and to God's work. That was what I was going to do, right? And so that was, again, I've I think I've told you before, I'm not materialistic at all. I've just got really great taste and stuff, like really good taste and stuff. So, but that was what, that was Brian's idea. That was what I would decided I was going to do. And so I was going to school for business and had all these kind of plans. And I can tell you to this day where I was sitting and I can remember this sermon on a Sunday night at my home church in Leesburg, my pastor, Pastor Charles Rossell was preaching. And I honestly don't remember what he was preaching about, but I remember him saying this. At the end of it, he, he, he asked this question, what are you running away from that you know God's calling you towards? I don't remember what the sermon was about. I don't remember what scripture he used. I just remember that question at the end of the sermon and something overtaking me in a way that I can't even describe right now with words. I mean, my, I, my, I was just overwhelmed. I had the hair on my, standing up on my arms, goosebumps. Every, and goosebumps isn't necessarily a sign of the Holy Spirit. It may just be you had bad tacos. But in this case, it was way more than that, right? I mean, there was just all up, all over me, inside of me. It was this, I got to stop running. I got to go where God's called me to go. I got to do what God's called me to do. And without almost even thinking, back then, I don't know if you grew up in a church like this, you always ended the sermon. Everybody stood up and sung just as I am 15 times and everybody had to come forward because you could only receive Jesus at the front of the church, right? That's how you became a Christian was actually walking the aisle and right here, that's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm, Making fun, but I'm not. But anyway, you know, we always, you had to come forward, right? You had to come forward to make a decision. And so we stand up, we start singing. And just like that, I stepped out and I'm making a beeline down the altar. And next thing you know, I'm on my knees at the steps at the front of that church, First Baptist Church in Leesburg. And I am praying and I'm crying, which is not me at all. 
right? And, and the next thing you know, I'm, I'm out. They, they, you know, somebody, one of our pastoral counselors kind of took me back in the back and we sat and talked and prayed. And, and they're like, Brian, what's going on? I'm like, I, I'm supposed to be a pastor. And I haven't wanted to do it. I haven't been wanting to go. I have, I've been running. I, I, and right then and there, I've never forgot it. And again, I don't, I don't remember the whole sermon, but I remember the end of that sermon and it changed me forever. Went home that night, told my parents, here's the deal. About a month later, I was changing where I was going to college. I ended up in Tennessee at Union University, a Christian liberal arts university. Got my uh, degree in, in ministry and all of that. It changed everything about what I was doing that, that one moment. You, you've had those experiences, right? I mean, I hope that you have, that you can remember just the word of God doing something. And it wasn't because of my pastor. It was the spirit of God that was doing that in me, right? You following this? And here's why I, I'm telling you that story. This is Jonah's entire sermon. Eight words. In fact, in Hebrew, it's not even eight words. It's five words in Hebrew, right? So I'm gonna give Jonah the benefit of the doubt. I'm gonna give him three extra words. Eight words, that's all he preaches. If a young pastor came into my office and sat down and said, hey, I want you to give me your thoughts on my sermon. Here it is, yet 40 days, and then of a shall be. Better, pastor Jay, better yet, right? He's down there today working to get Village Point started. He was in my office this past week. We met, talked, prayed together, like, if he had walked in my office this week and said, Brian, I've got my first sermon for October 22nd. You want to hear it? Sure. Here it is. Yet 40 days and Horizon West will be overthrown. What do you think? I'd be like, I'll tell you what I think. I think we got the wrong guy. That's what, we, that's what I think. <laughs> like, that's your sermon? You've had all this time and that's, that's what you, eight words, that's it? And by the way, that's the worst sermon you could ever preach in your life. This, I would never preach this. And yet this is what Jonah preaches. This is it. And look at what happens as a result of Jonah preaching this eight-word English sermon that's actually only five words in Hebrew. Jonah goes in and he preaches this sermon, and here's what happens. The people of Nineveh believed. Eight words. Forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Eight words. That's all he preached. And the people believed. And I'll tell you why, a reason that's not why they believed. They didn't believe because Jonah was a great preacher. They didn't believe because he got all creative. They didn't believe because he just wowed them with some new understanding of something they'd never heard before. He just, he just says eight words. They believed. Why? Because the Spirit of God took those eight words and convicted their hearts. They believed because God was at work in those eight words. The people believed God. And as a result of believing God, what did they do? They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. Now, why did they put on sackcloth? Well, it was a, it was a way to show mourning in that day and age. It was a very common practice. If you were in mourning, you would put this on. And not only did the people believe, though, look what else happened. So did the king. Like, Check this out, this next verse. Um, the word reached the king, the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. He removed his robe. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in ash. Again, he, he's, he's mourning himself. He's repenting. It's a way of him saying, what have we done? We need to get this right. And as a result of showing this grief, look at what he does. He, he mourns, and then he issues this proclamation throughout all of Nineveh. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Why violence? Because they were a violent society. Already talked about that. Who knows? Here's why we need to repent. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger. God may yet relent. God may yet forgive. We need to turn and follow him. And what motivated them to do that? It only, I want, you to, I want you to see this, and I want you to hear this, and I don't want you ever to forget this. It only took eight words for God to change the city. Actually, only five, right, in Hebrew, but eight words. It only took eight words for God to change the city. And why do I want you to not forget that? Here's why, and I want you to hear me, church. Church people, that's me and you, are really good at making our 
calling more difficult than it actually is. We're really good at making what it means to walk in a manner worthy of Christ more complicated than it actually is. Pastors, church leaders are magnificent at making church more complicated than it has to be. We've got to justify our existence, I guess. I don't know, but we're all that way in our relationship with Christ. We are great at making it more complicated than it has to be. Early on in ministry, I'll tell you this. True story. I thought when I first started as a pastor, I, I thought my job every week was to craft the perfect sermon that by the time I finished preaching, the only logical conclusion of everybody in the room was to follow Jesus or to follow Jesus more or to finally believe. Like that's, That was my job, to craft the perfect sermon that would lead people there every single week. And then I realized after I was so exhausted trying to do that, that number one, I wasn't that good. I wasn't good enough to do that every week. And number two, it wasn't my job anyway. My job as a pastor is not to get you to believe anything. My job, according to Scripture, as a pastor is to handle as accurately as I can the word of truth and leave the results up to the Spirit of God. Because any change I create in you is temporary at best. I might be able to motivate a group of people to something or encourage them or discourage them. There might be some change in behavior I can guilt you into. Anybody ever been in that kind of sermon? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, I can try that. I'm not exactly a big fan of that. And I can tell you this. When I realized early on in ministry in my early 20s that it wasn't my job to get anybody to believe anything. It was to handle the Scripture accurately and leave all of the results up to the Spirit of God. It was so incredibly freeing. And you know what else it did? It made me enjoy getting up and unpacking what Scripture says versus dread or feel guilty of what my sermon did or did not do. Am I making sense? And if you're sitting there thinking, well, that makes sense for you, Brian. What does this, what does this have to do with me? Everything to do with you. What that means is that when God has that good work that we saw week one, that good work that he's already prepared in advance for you to walk in, when you say yes and you're faithful to step into that and walk in it, you don't have to worry if you're good enough to make anything come of that. God's the one at work in that. All you got to do is say, yes, God, I'll be obedient. Yes, God, I'll be faithful. Yes, God, I'll follow you. That's it. Again, we make it more complicated than it has to be. You know, the Apostle Paul, I, I want to show you something in just a second from the New Testament, something the Apostle Paul wrote. And he was writing, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, but one of his letters he was writing to the Corinthian people, the church in Corinth. And in this letter, he says something that has everything to do with this right here. That God will take our simple, inadequate efforts and empower them to do more than you and I ever could accomplish through them. Paul talks about this idea. Now you've got to remember who Paul is. Paul was a brilliant guy. The Apostle Paul, he was. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee, well-educated, smart, intelligent. He was an orator of orators, all right? He was, he, the guy could talk. And we have examples of that, actually. Uh, in, in Acts, he actually shows up at a place called Mars Hill, right, in, in, in Greece. And he starts having this dialogue with the most brilliant minds of Greece, the philosophers of ancient Greece. And at one point, he actually pulls back. and He's like, hey, you've got this statue to an unknown God. Let me talk to you what I know that you don't know. Here's who that unknown God is. He has this great, like, that is a masterful uh, sermon you just preached there, bro. But he's writing to the church in Corinth, and here's what he says about how smart he is and how qualified he is and how competent he is. Look at what he says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He says, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And here's why this is so important to grab onto, guys. One of the most brilliant minds of the early church, one of the smartest apostles, the guy that could argue any point with anyone and probably come out ahead, and everybody knew how smart he was, he stops and he's writing them back and says, guys, remember this. When I came to you, I did not come to you 
with this big argument, with these wise words, I did not show up trying to impress you with what I know and with who I am. That is not how I came to you. Instead, here's how I came. Here's what he says. My speech and my message were not in the plausible words of wisdom, not in what I knew, but my speech and my message were in the demonstration of the spirit of power. If anything was going to change, I was clear that it wasn't me arguing you into faith. If anything was going to change in you, it was only because the spirit of God would demonstrate his power by doing something inside of you. And that's what I wanted. And here's why I wanted that. So that your faith would not rest in men, but would rest in the power of God. I showed up not trying to impress you. I showed up not caring what people thought. I showed up not trying to be the best orator and teacher and preacher you've ever heard. I just showed up bringing the spirit of God with me and letting him empower anything that I said or didn't say that you would find hope in him and your hope would not be in me and who I am and what I can do, but your hope for salvation, your hope for eternity and forevermore would rest in the power of God. That is what my hope was in when I came to you. This is what Paul says. I'll tell you, I, I can't tell you how many times out here after a service, as y'all are leaving, somebody will walk by, stop, talk to me, and, and will say something along the lines of, man, Brian, I don't know if you've been following me around all week or what, but that sermon was for me today. You are preaching to me, and here's why. And they'll tell me a story and something that God stirred in them or did in them as they were listening to the sermon. And then right as they leave, somebody else will walk up. Man, would you follow me around this week? Because this sermon was just for me. Here's what I needed to hear, and it's something completely opposite. Right, And here's why I love hearing that. Because what, you know what it tells me? That had nothing to do with me. Because there's no way, I'm, every time I hear that conversation, God just reminds me, Brian, this isn't about you. This wasn't done by you. Because you're not good enough to create one sermon that could reach that person and lead them to that place, and this person over here and lead them to a different place, and this person back here and lead them to a third. You can't do that. I'm not that good. You're not that good, Brian. God, God's telling me I'm that good. It's my words. I'm speaking through you to them. The Spirit of God doing that. You could get up, Brian, and preach eight words. And if I want to do something, I'll do it with those eight words. And here's why this should matter to every one of us in here that calls ourselves a Christian. No matter how inadequate you ever feel to say yes to God's call in your life, remember two things. God is a God of second chances. And when you say yes to him, he's the one that's gonna do the work, not you. You actually have nothing to offer someone that's truly what they need other than the power of God. And if that does anything this morning, here's what I hope it does. I hope it encourages you and encourages me to be willing to say yes whenever God calls, wherever he says to go and whatever he asks us to do. Here's what I'm getting at this morning and I wanna close with this. If you don't get anything else, remember this. God empowers our abilities when we give him our availability. God empowers our abilities when we give him our availability. I will go on record saying this to the day I'm no longer here and far beyond I'm after I'm gone. Anything good that's ever happened in the life of the church at South Lake had nothing to do with me or you and everything to do with the goodness and power of God. That's my confidence and my hope. That's why as we look forward to 25 years that we're gonna celebrate in November, we're gonna have a great time that first Sunday in November celebrating 25 years, but mostly you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna look at all the ways that God has been gracious and good and shown his power in our church for the last 25 years, knowing and having full confidence that he's gonna do it again. Have comp great confidence in who God is and great humility about who you are. Be available to God and he will do more in you and through you than you can ever imagine. Friends, all you gotta do, one thing, say yes. When he calls, just say yes. When he invites you to serve, say yes.
when he prompts you to pick up the phone and text or call somebody, because, and you might not even know why, say, say yes. When he, what, what, just, just say yes. And watch him do more than you ever thought possible. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are indeed a God of second chances. That there is nothing we could ever do or say that would cause you to reject us or run from us the way we have all rejected and run from you at some point. God, thank you for that. Thank you for Jonah's story and the reminder that all you're really asking is for us to say yes and to follow. We don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to know how it's all gonna play out. If we would simply get up every day and say, God, lead me and wherever you lead me, I'm gonna follow and I'm gonna say yes. I believe because I've seen it in scripture that we will see you do more than anything we could possibly imagine. And I pray that our hope not only as a church, but our hope as individual followers of Christ would always and only be in your power, your gospel, your grace, your love, and your mercy. Thank you, God, for saving us and changing us and calling us. May we walk in a manner worthy of that calling. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen.